on Business Incorporated today. Nigeria launches Africa's first cassava-based sorbitol factory in Oyo State. And Africa's largest bank, Standard Bank, slashes Ghana's growth to 3.1% from the earlier 6.2%. Meanwhile, South Africa and Botswana trade to fund the improvement and extension of rail links. Oh, welcome to Business Incorporated here on Channels Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. We start as usual with trading market numbers in Africa. Uh, we see that at intraday in Africa, it didn't look so good. Uh, South Africa GSE's index uh, is the sole gainer as intraday. It's like just up slightly 0.7%, while Nigeria's NGX was marginally down 0.04%. Elsewhere on the continent, EGX 30 is down 0.52%. Meanwhile, Kenya closed Friday. Green 0.52%. In the Middle East, uh, a different picture we see there. Uh, all markets with track were green. In the United Arab Emirates, the Abu Dhabi index was up 1.15%. Dubai index was also up 0.80%. Elsewhere in the region, Saudi Arabia's market index climbed 0.44%, while the Qatari index was not left out uh, in the gains. The market was significantly up 1.37% at intraday. Now let's move to Europe now and see what's happening there. Two more ships uh, with, loaded with grain have departed Ukraine this morning, and that's boosting hopes that the United Nations brokered agreement between the country and Russia could help relieve rising commodity prices and ease hunger concerns in the developing world and, of course, other parts of the world. What we have joining us uh, to help us uh, see how it's affecting Europe there, uh, Stephen Bersley joins us from Berlin. Hi, Stephen. Good afternoon. Well, Germany has especially been outspoken about the need for a solution to interrupted green shipments out of Ukraine. Uh, is the situation improving now that we have grains leaving uh, Ukraine? Well, it's certainly a positive sign. There are now 10 ships in total that have loaded up at Ukrainian ports. Uh, and the first has actually arrived uh, at its destination in Turkey with 12,000 tons of corn. Another that was expected to arrive in Lebanon yesterday, that is Sunday, uh, was actually held up in another Turkish port for unknown reasons. So that goes to show there are some hitches here, but overall this seems to be a positive development compared to recent months in which there were no ships leaving with grain exports. Now, Germany has been especially critical of Russia in past months, saying that it's been weaponizing hunger essentially by blockading Ukrainian ports uh, where grain grain shipments uh, do take place. Now, Ukraine and Russia together make up a massive amount of global exports for critical grains such as corn, wheat, as well as seeds, sunflower seeds and oils. Uh, those all uh, have destinations typically in the Middle East and Africa, and those regions have been feeling the pinch in recent months. So for global food prices, which have, we've seen has dramatically risen in the, in the couple, last couple of months. Well, we definitely saw those prices rise in the first weeks following the beginning of the war. Investors uh, speculating that prices would only rise, and we saw futures contracts therefore rising in response to that. Uh, then we saw India as a response to uh, concerns over supply. They decided to hold back their wheat exports, which they were, they were going to make available this year, and that added to that upward pressure on prices. Since then, we've seen those prices actually come back down a bit, uh, especially as more regions have declared exports ready to fill in that gap, including the U.S. and other areas with um, more positive wheat uh, uh, yields in the year, corn yields, things like that. Um, so that is a, a good sign. Uh, there is still unclarity, I should say, in clarity when it comes to what could happen next. Supply chains are still disrupted around the world. And then, of course, with the war, no one knows for sure what's going to happen, how long this agreement uh, between both sides, Ukraine, Russia, Turkey is also a member of this, and the UN is overall broken it, how long this will hold up. Um, you know, the importance of it we can see throughout the Middle East, throughout Africa. If you look at Kenya, for example, it's going to the polls on Tuesday. Cost of living there has been a major campaign issue, and food is a big part of that. We've also seen in Egypt in recent months Months, how disruptive uh, rising wheat prices can be uh, for everyday people there. Let's turn our attention to the market now. How's that looking uh, this afternoon? 
Well, investors in Europe having to digest mixed signals over the weekend. Uh, one was that positive uh, job data coming out of the U.S., which could actually actually lead to more assertive action from the Fed when it comes to raising interest rates. That could weigh down on stocks. Uh, the On the other side, we've seen some more positive uh, signals coming out of China, some positive data when it comes to exports. Um, and that is uh, a positive for businesses. Uh, what we've seen on Monday is that uh, the glass is more half full for European businesses. Uh, the major index is coming out in positive territory. Uh, and then this week, they will be following more quarterly releases, quarterly earnings reports, that is, to see where businesses are right now uh, with their earnings. And then all eyes will be on U.S. inflation data coming out later this week. That could really determine uh, the direction of major markets uh, for uh, the next days to come. All right, Stephen, thank you so much for that. Uh, earnings also going here in Nigeria. Well, let's uh, go to the UK now, and I can tell you that the conversation is not very far from what's going on in Europe, after all, the used to be one continent and the world is one, uh, because uh, joining us now, Juliana from our London studio. Uh, Juliana, I, I guess, uh, oh, you're not in the studio. Well, you're out for some air. Good to see you, Juliana. But uh, we're here in the UK. There are campaigns to stop payments of energy bills. Good afternoon, Innie, from a bright, sunny London. I'm just a stone's throw away from the studio, actually. It's just um, above uh, my head. Uh, but look, you know, there are huge issues. I'm also having some issues with my audio as well, if that could be fixed in the gallery. Um, but yes, there is a non-payment um, campaign currently ongoing. I'm having some audio issues, um, Inny, which is making it really difficult for me to speak to you, I'm afraid. I don't know if... All right. Okay, Juliana, uh, we'll try and fix that and, and fix get back that. to you. We'll try and fix that uh, and get back to you, Juliana. So I will try and get Juliana back uh, without the issues uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, meanwhile, let's move to Asian markets now, where tech stocks in Hong Kong pulled the broader index lower on Monday, as Asian markets traded, mixed SoftBank reported earnings after the market closed in Japan. Alibaba dropped 4.41%. JD.com slipped 3.26%. The Hang Seng Index ended the session 0.77%, lower at 20,045. Hong Kong's Kachev. Pacific jumped 1.42% after authorities announced that hotel quarantine for travelers would be reduced to three days from seven days, though there would be a four-day surveillance period after the quarantine. In Australia, the S&P X200 closed mildly higher at over 7,000 shares of OZ. Millionaire spiked 35.25% after the company rejected BHB's $8.34 billion Australian dollars a takeover bid. The Nikkei 225 in Japan was up 0.26%, while the Topics Index was 0.22% higher. South Korea's KOSPI was slightly higher, 2,493.1, and the Kasdaq shares 0.09% to 830.86. Mainland China markets were positive. The Shanghai Composites gained 0.31, and Shenzhen Components rose 0.27. MCSI's Brodex Index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan lost 0.39%. Well, let's see if uh, we can have Juliana without the audio uh, now. Hi, Juliana. Is it better now? All right. I'm, I'm really hoping it's better. So what <laughs> I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump back into what we were discussing, which is... It, it, it hasn't improved, I'm afraid, any, but I'm still going to keep talking, though I can hear myself talking, which makes it really difficult to think. But um, Don't Pay UK uh, started off last week. I think some people thought it was a gimmick, you know, urging hundreds of thousands of people across the United Kingdom not to pay their bills. I think this uh, became a really big issue after the Bank of England uh, Governor Andrew Bailey uh, released his pretty apocalyptic um, memo last week after the monetary policy decided to hike rates. Um, I, unfortunately, Eli, it's impossible for me to think straight with this. Um, All right, Juliana, so we'll, just, uh, we'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so technical things there uh, has to be dealt with from the background.
Well, let's go to the United States market now. Stock features rose this morning following the S&P 500's third straight weekly gain as investors shifted focus to a key inflation report this week. Uh, features on the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 139 points, uh, 0.47 there. We see in the NASDAQ was also up more than half a percent, uh, 0.64 there. Uh, Dow Jones up 0.39 percent. Uh, Monday's gain follows a weekly rise for S&P and NASDAQ composite as a surprisingly strong monthly jobs report, that job report that we saw last week. Let's go to the oil space now. Prices dropped today, hovering near multi-month lows as recession fares hurt demand outlook and data pointed to a slow recovery in China's crude imports last month. Brent crude features dropped 74 cents, which is 0.8%, to $94.18 a barrel. And front month prices hit the lowest level since February last year. U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude was uh, at $88.34 a barrel, and that's down uh, also 0.8%. That's 67 cents, extending losses after 9.7% for last week. China, the world's top crude importer, imported 8.79 million barrels per day of crude in July, and that's off from four-year low in June, but still 9.5% lower than a year ago. Chinese refiners drew down stockpiles amid high crude prices and weak domestic margins, even as the country's overall exports gained momentum. Let's see what's happening in the metals market now. Looking at gold, uh, prices edged lower today, or prices edged lower this morning after solid U.S. Uh, jobs data last week boosted the prospect of aggressive interest rate hikes by the U.S. Federal Reserve, and that lifted dollar and treasury yields. Spot gold was down 0.1% to 1,771.74 per ounce uh, after dropping 1% in the previous session. Traders currently see a 73.5% probability that the Fed continues the pace of 75 basis points rate hike for its next policy decision in September to tame soaring inflation. Spot silver was flat at $19.87 per ounce. Platinum fell also 1.3% to $920.25, and palladium was steady at $2,125.68 per ounce. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll settle on the African continent happily, starting from Nigeria. That's after the break. This is Business Incorporated here on Channel Television. Yeah, welcome back. You're still watching Business Incorporated here on Channel Television. Let's start from Ghana. The Africa's biggest bank, the Standard Bank, has slashed Ghana's growth rate forecast for this year, 2022. And it's gone from 6.2% to 3.1%. Well, I guess uh, the factors are by now known by a lot of people. It has also lowered its 2023 gross domestic products forecast for the country to 4.1% from the earlier projection of 5.8%. The government in the 2022 mid-year budget review cut the growth rate for this year to 3.7% from the earlier projection of 5.8%. But according to Standard Bank's Africa Market Revealed report, shows that the country's growth now faces a confluence of downside risks in 2022 and 2023. And in Nigeria, uh, well, not in Nigeria yet, South Africa and Botswana have agreed to fund improvement and extension of rail links between the countries in a bid to boost trade and better connect Botswana to export market. Transnet Freight Rail will collaborate with Botswana Rail to fix parts of the 126-kilometer rail line between uh, the cities in South Africa's northwest province and Mafinkeng on the border with Botswana. And that's helping South Africa's landlocked northern neighbor get its minerals, including thermal coal, to the market. European countries are scrambling to meet their coal needs after a ban on imports of the fossil fuel from Russia. And coal-rich countries like Botswana are looking to cash in on the surge 
in demand. The rail revamp, revamp will enable heavy haul trains to travel from Botswana to South Africa's ports of Richards Bay and Durban. The project aims to be up and running in the next 24 months. The TFR and BR will also build a rail line from Mamabula in Botswana to Lepalale in South Africa's Limpopo province. And in Congo, Italian energy group ENI has agreed to acquire EX Exmar Group's export LNG, which owns the Tango floating liquefied natural gas a vessel to produce LNG in Congo Republic. The 20, 2017 built Tango floating uh, liquefaction plant has an LNG uh, capacity of 16,100 uh, meters and a liquefaction capacity of uh, about 0 0.6 million tons per year. And uh, ENI plans to deploy the Tango FNLG to support its natural gas development projects in Marine X11 offshore block in the Republic of Congo. So back here in Nigeria, the factory has been, a cassava-based orbital factory has been described as the first in Africa and the second largest in the world. And it was launched in Oyo State, southwest Nigeria. The factory has the capacity to produce 25 tons of sorbitol per day. Sorbitol is a natural occurring sweetener which is synthetically extracted from glucose. And due to its low calories ratio, it is used in sugar-free foods, pharmaceutical products, oral care products, including mouth fresheners, and toothpaste. The executive advisor to the Oyo State Governor says this is going to bring a new change to not just Nigeria, but to Africa as a whole. The Oyo State Government and management of the Central Bank of Nigeria and key players in agribusiness converge on the agrarian community of Alaide village in Adwawai, Oyo State, to witness history. Today. For the first time in Africa, a cassava-based sorbitol factory becomes operational. Sorbitol is a low-calorie sweetener which is synthetically extracted from glucose. It has several uses which include use in sugar-free foods, pharmaceutical and dental care products among the others. The central bank is confident that the importation of sorbitol would reduce as more jobs are being created. In the cassava valley chain development, the bank has so far supported the cultivation of 102,567 hectares of land and output of over 3 million metric tons. Governor Makine discloses that the state government would also embark on the rehabilitation of feeder roads across the state to complement projects like the Sorbitol factory, among others. The role of government so far has been to build the infrastructure needed for these businesses to locate their factories and farms here in Oyo State. This sorbitol factory is largely reliant on cassava as the main raw material. Cassava can be used to produce monosodium glutamate, vitamin C, vitamin E, ethanol, ethanol, I mean, sorbitol, name it. It can produce more than 300 different types of products that we currently import into Africa. To some of the stakeholders, the project is a nexus between agriculture and industrialization. This is a fundamental way to raise living standards in our rural areas, to lift rural economies and make sure that all those bountiful things that people look for in cities, they can also have in the, in the, in the rural areas. Farmers in the environs are happy about this project, as it will be an off-taker of large-scale cassava production to their delight along that corridor. Bukola Uriu, Channel Television News. And now in Nigeria, the rising debt stock 
incurred by the government is becoming increasingly prom problematic in the face of dwindling government revenue and unsustainable burden of subsidy payment. That's the view of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And they are speaking uh, and saying that uh, Nigeria is going through a debt crisis and uh, the aggregate expenditure for 2022 was estimated at 17.32 trillion naira. At the end of April, pro rata revenue of 5.77 trillion naira was expected. Unfortunately, only 1.63 trillion naira was realized as the federal government retain, retained revenue as of April. Within the same period, government's actual spending stood at 4.72 trillion naira, accounted for by a whooping sum of 1.7 four trillion naira expended on debt servicing. Consequently, the LCCI is asking that the federal government will look to dealing with the issue of insecurity in the country, which has prompted increased spending on defense, and uh, also that the federal government uh, should borrow from cheaper sources and consider deficit financing from equity instead of expensive debts borrowed and used for recurrent expenditure. They also say that the commercialization model proposed for the NNPC Limited is the right direction to go, and that uh, once the plan succeeds next year, it should be replicated with other national corporate assets that are in other parts of the country. Well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of this first episode. We have four more for this week. I'm Ini John Mekwa. See you tomorrow.